Good morning, and welcome to the Jack D. Gordon Institute's 20th years after 9-11, an in-depth look at the US foreign policy in Afghanistan and the Middle East. My name is Hector David, and I am the deputy director here at the Jack D. Gordon Institute, and I will be serving as your MC for this event. On behalf of our director and our entire staff here at the Gordon Institute, I'd like to welcome you all, welcome all students and faculty, <clears throat> as well as special guests from our South Florida Intelligence Community Centers for Academic Excellence Consumption partners from Miami-Dade College, Broward College, and Florida Memorial University to this event. Thank you for joining us today to commemorate the 20th anniversary of 9-11. <clears throat> Before I get started, I'd like to encourage all of you to visit our website, gordoninstitute.fiu.edu, and explore Gordon Institute's phenomenal programming and student opportunities, including our workforce development programs. Also, I would like to recognize our special guests joining us today from the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs, our Dean, our founding Dean, John, uh, Dr. John Stack. <clears throat> Again, students, I encourage you to check our programming. We have some phenomenal programming for tomorrow, uh, Thursday, September 9th, on the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake, where a panel of distinguished speakers, including Ambassador Daniel Foote, U.S. Special Envoy to Haiti, Lieutenant General, retired Keen, Ken Keen, Associate Dean for Leadership Development at Emory University, and Ms. Ann Lee, CEO of Community Organized Relief Effort Corps, and John Mark DeMatte, CEO of Hopital Auberge Schweitzer Haiti, will join us to discuss uh, the Haiti earthquake response and relief efforts and how to support Haitian solutions to the security and political crisis engulfing the country. This phenomenal panel will be moderated by renowned Miami Herald journalist, Jacqueline Charles. Additionally, I would like to invite all students to join us for our Fall 2021 National Security Workshop Series, featuring intelligence practitioners from the FBI, DHS, NCTC, and National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And finally, I would encourage all our students participating today to join us on October 1st for the Gordon Institute's Insider's Guide for Careers in National Security and Intelligence to learn more about the amazing careers awaiting in the national security and intelligence workforce. And also to learn a little bit more about FIU's nationally recognized ICCA Workforce Development Pathway Program. On to today's programming. On the eve of the 20th anniversary of 9-11, we are proud to sponsor today's event, which is comprised of two sessions. Session one will feature a conversation with renowned journalist and New York Times bestselling author, Peter Bergen on his latest book, The Rise and Fall of Osama Bin Laden. Session two will feature a panel discussion among experts on US foreign policy in Afghanistan and the Middle East. I kindly ask participants to mute your microphones and your video camera and to um, cl close out your video cameras to submit before we start this event. Also, please make sure to submit your questions to the uh, chat box in uh, the call during your respective moderator's question and answer session. Without further ado, I would like to call Dr. Pen Dr. Vanda Felba Brown, who will serve as a moderator for session one and will introduce her keynote speaker. Dr. Vanda Felba Brown is a senior fellow in the Center for Security and Strategy and Technology in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. She is a director of the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors and is also the co-director of the Africa Security Initiative. Dr. Felva Brown is an expert on international and internal conflicts and non-traditional security threats. Her fieldwork and research are extensive and have covered, among others, Afghanistan, Southeast Asia, Burma, Indonesia, the Indian region, Mexico, and many, many states in Africa. Among her many notable roles, Dr. Felva Brown was a senior advisor to the congressionally mandated Afghanistan Peace Process Study Group. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Felva Brown. Well, thank you very much, Hector. It's a, a great pleasure to be able to have this conversation with you today and with uh, Peter Bergen, as well as uh, with uh, the panelists in the second part of the session. This is a poignant moment uh, that we are meeting uh, on the 20th anniversary of the most destructive terrorist event in the United States. 9-11, a poignant also and significant because the United States just wrapped down its uh, military role 
uh, in Afghanistan, its role in the war in Afghanistan. And 20 years later, uh, the Taliban is back in power, even though in uh, 2001, the United States uh, went to Afghanistan after 9-11 to <clears throat> depose the Taliban and destroy its regime. And I couldn't imagine a better person to be talking with uh, today about those issues. And uh, the lead terrorist, uh, the iconic terrorist Osama bin Laden, than uh, Peter Bergen. Peter is uh, a prominent, well-known journalist. He is also the vice president uh, for global studies and fellows at the New America Foundation, where he is also the director of the International Security and Future Wars Program. Among his very many roles, uh, Peter is a CNN national security analyst and also writes a weekly column for CNN. He is a member of the Homeland Security Experts Group and author of nine books, several of which were New York Times bestsellers and received numerous awards, such as from the Washington Post. Among those award-winning books uh, are The Longest War, The Enduring Conflict Between America and Al-Qaeda, and Manhunt, The 10-Year Search for Bin Laden from 9-11 to Abu Tabat. Those books um, received, again, very many awards, and Manhunt um, was the uh, inspiration, the source for which the HBO uh, movie was made, and in 2013 won uh, the Emmy for uh, the best documentary. And indeed, Peter's role uh, as an educator, as a journalist, uh, has um, uh, not just uh, included um, uh, CNN, uh, TV, and uh, print sources. He's also been uh, the producer an executive, uh, 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 also been executive producer and hosted multiple documentaries for HBO, CNN, National Geographic, Showtime, and others. Again, many of those documentaries received uh, various awards, uh, including in um, uh, including in uh, 2017, the Legion of Brothers, which then in 2018 was nominated for an award. And as was already uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, Peter just has a new book out, The Rise and Fall of Osama Bin Laden. Um, Peter, uh, please tell us about the book. Well, Vanda, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you to FIU for organizing this. Um, well, you know, tomorrow will mark um, the 20th anniversary of the assassination of Akbar Shah Massoud, interestingly. And um, you know, history is sort of repeating itself in a strange way because I, when Massoud was killed on September 9th, 2001, this was really bin Laden's curtain raiser for 9-11. He knew that he had to, he knew that the 9-11 attacks were going to happen. He was warned on Thursday that the attacks were going to happen on Tuesday. And he knew that this was going to cause a problem for the Taliban, so he had to give them a gift. And that gift was Akhmed Shah Massoud's head. Here we are 20 years later, um, and unfortunately, the Biden administration didn't follow the advice of the commission that Vanda served on as an expert, which was to retain uh, some kind of military presence in Afghanistan, as a result of which the Taliban have completely taken over Afghanistan. And it seems within the last 24 hours have defeated the forces of Ahmed Shah Massoud's son, Ahmed Massoud, Massoud, who is 32 and was leading the anti-Taliban resistance. And the Taliban today is much stronger than it was before 9-11 because now they've had 20 years of warfare against the United States and the Afghan military. And they're armed with MRAP, um, you know, uh, MRAP vehicles, which are mine resistant vehicles. They're, they're armed with you know, armored Humvees and other American military equipment. So it's kind of a sad uh, way to memorialize the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Siraj Akhani, um, you know, one of the takeaways of the documents that I examined in Abbottabad is how close Al Qaeda and the, the Akhanis are, which I think we kind of knew, but the documents really don't lie. And um, when I, one of the, I wrote the book for a few reasons. One, I teach at Arizona State, which is uh, has a close relationship with FIU, um, and some of the kids that I teach, they're not kids; they're there are people in their you know, 18, 19, 20. I realized we weren't born on 9-11. And for them, 9-11 is as distant an event as the Korean War is for me. And it's an event that's ended into history. And people joining the US military today 
are some of the some of the Marines who were killed outside Kabul airport weren't born on 9-11. And so it seemed to me a good moment to kind of try and assess the life and and of Osama bin Laden, who is one of the few people we can really say changed history. Um, there are the you know, there are other more significant people who've changed history um, for both good and for ill, but bin Laden is one of the few people I think we can really say in the early 20th century who changed the way the United States organized its foreign policy, um, who changed in very unexpected ways uh, the structure of the Middle East. Uh, he didn't intend on 9-11 to do the things that happened. Um, let, me, so let me kind of throw out what he did intend on 9-11. He, we met with him in 97 for his first television interview and he told us the United States was weak. He based that analysis on the pullout of US troops in Somalia after the Black Hawk Down incident in which 18 American servicemen were killed. He also paid close attention to the pullout of um, the Reagan administration pulling out of Beirut in 1983 after the Marine barracks attack where 241 American servicemen were killed. Well, you know, that, that analysis was, you know, a very faulty analysis because obviously we weren't going to pull out of the Middle East simply because we got attacked in Washington and New York, but this was really bin Laden's view. Um, and he carried out the 9-11 attacks, which were a great tactical success, but they were a strategic failure. They did not result in what bin Laden wanted, which was the U.S. pulling out of the Middle East and its client regimes like the Saudi regime and the Egyptian regime to fall, quite the reverse. In fact, we're more involved in the Middle East than we've been in our, in our, ever in our history. Even with the recent pullout of Afghanistan, we're still deeply involved in the Middle East. We have 2,500 troops in Iraq that we simply renamed, instead of combat troops, we, we renamed them non-combat troops in order to kind of deal with uh, kind of some Iraqi opposition to their presence in, in Iraq, which is, by the way, something we could have done in Afghanistan, but chose not to do. Um, so when we have uh, the largest base in the Middle East is now housing tens of thousands of Afghan refugees, which is in Doha, Qatar, just outside Doha in Qatar. Uh, that um, base didn't exist before 9-11. We have bases in Djibouti and in the United Arab Emirates and any other number of countries. So bin Laden's great vision completely backfired. But getting back to the documents, the other reason I wrote the book is, you know, it was only in the Trump administration that 470,000 files were released from the bin Laden compound. Now, most of those files were not useful. Some of them were cartoons that his kids were watching. Bin Laden would also draft 50 versions of any given mem memo. But when you kind of boil out what was actually useful in those 470,000 files, there's 6,000 pages of bin Laden's memos to his fam memos to members of Al Qaeda, memos to our affili affiliates of Al Qaeda, love letters to his wife, one of his wives, um, and you know personal family letters. And you can really assemble an interesting picture of bin Laden from these documents because. They stretch for, a really, for five and a half years of his life that he was living in Abbottabad. Some of the documents are even older. The most useful document, which I opened the book with, is um, I opened the night that bin Laden was killed. And it was Amal, his youngest wife. He had three wives with him in Abbottabad. Uh, his youngest wife is 28, his oldest wife was 62. Um, and he, he, they, he had another wife who was 54. They're all living with him and they have a dozen kids and grandkids living at the compound. And I opened the book with kind of what he, what he was concerned about the, uh, in, the, in the time that he was, just before he was killed. His big concern was the Arab Spring. And so one of the most useful documents that came out of the, the Trump administration uh, putting everything out was a 228 page family diary. Now the CIA uh, incorrectly described this as a bin Laden journal when, uh, when it was released. It actually is something more interesting potentially, which is it was a bin Laden family journal. And what this bin Laden family journal, it's 228 pages, it's handwritten in Arabic. It hasn't received, I think, the attention it deserves because it's kind of difficult to interpret. It wasn't meant for public consumption. The document uh, was created by bin Laden's two adult daughters who when Every night they would discuss the momentous events of the Arab Spring. Now, in bin Laden's mind, the Arab Spring was the most important event, series of events in the Middle East in centuries. This is his own, I'm, I'm quoting him directly. 
but they were very conscious of the fact that bin Laden and his ideas and his followers were not involved in the Arab Spring. And so bin Laden, you know, people listening to this might be surprised to know that bin Laden's two oldest wives both had PhDs. One in child psychology, her name is Um Hamza. She was a 62 year old. She had an independent career before she married bin Laden. She was a teacher of deaf mute children. She married bin Laden at the very late age in Saudi terms of 35. And um, bin Laden really looked up to her as somebody who claimed descent from the Prophet Muhammad, which was very important to him as kind of an expert on the Quran and somebody who was highly educated. And he looked to her and his other oldest wife, Saham, who was age 54, the same age as bin Laden when he was killed. She had a, a PhD in Quranic grammar. Um, and both of these older wives helped him do his thinking. And he was very excited that his oldest wife, with whom he seems to have been the closest, suddenly reappeared in his life after a decade. She had been living under house arrest in Iran after the 9-11 the attacks. She fled to Iran. She was under house arrest. Al-Qaeda kidnapped an Iranian diplomat in Pakistan. As part of the prisoner swap, she got out. And on February 15, 2011, she reappeared at bin Laden's compound. And he'd been sending her these very kind of almost love letters as she kind of moved towards him from Iran, saying how excited he was that she was coming back into his life and how much he'd missed her and how much he wanted her to weigh in on some of his big strategic um, kind of questions. What to say about the 10th anniversary of 9-11, which was approaching? What to say about the Arab Spring? So these discussions around the family dining room table, both before and after dinner, were deemed so important that the family started putting them down in the diary. And basically what would happen every day is bin Laden would, would, would watch, a lot of Al, uh, watch a lot of Al Jazeera, the coverage of the revolutions in Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Yemen. And he would then tell his wives and his two adult daughters and adult son what he thought. And they would sort of interview him about his thoughts. And they, they all wanted him to deliver a big speech because they labored under, a, under the delusional belief that if he delivered a big speech, he could somehow wrest control of the Arab Spring. Well, that was a crazy delusion, but it was a delusion they all had. And so every night uh, they would kind of try and get this speech together and put bin Laden's thoughts down on paper. And they were organizing the speech in the weeks before bin Laden was killed. And they were also very cognizant of the fact that the clock was ticking. At one point they say, you know, we need to get this speech out soon because, you know, the masses haven't heard from bin Laden and they really need to hear what he has to say. Bin Laden's big idea was that a council of religious scholars should advise the revolutions in, in Libya, in, in Egypt, in Tunisia, and, and advise the new governments. And of course, these religious scholars would undoubtedly have been Taliban-style religious scholars. Now, no one was asking for these ideas from Bin Laden, and uh, these, you know, but, they, but uh, Bin Laden and his immediate family, his family believed that he would deliver this speech and he would take control of the Arab Spring. That, of course, he never delivered the speech. He was killed on May 1st, May 2nd, 2011. The speech came out posthumously. It was actually a very bland speech, so they're saying it's great news about these revolutions. He mentioned the idea about this religious council advising the new governments, and no one paid any attention to these ideas. Before I just wrap up, there are a few other things, two, two or three other things that were really weighing on his mind in that period just before he was killed. The first, his bodyguards were about to leave him. Now, this was a very big deal because for him because they did everything for him. The, the bodyguards both came from a family originating in Pakistan, in northern Pakistan. So they spoke Pak Urdu and they spoke some Pashto, um, but they'd also grown up in Kuwait. So they spoke fluent Arabic. So they were immensely helpful to bin Laden because they spoke all the right languages. They've both been members of Al Qaeda since before 9 11. And they did everything from him, from the minor stuff of getting, you know, if he needed something from the grocery store, they would go out and get it. Uh, to the big thing, which was carrying his messages to other members of Al Qaeda. Um, and the house that they were hiding in for the past five and a half years was registered in one of the bodyguards' names. Now, the bodyguards were now fed up about looking after the world's most wanted man and all the risks that came with it. And they had good reason to be worried because, of course, they were both killed on the night of the raid. They were planning to leave bin Laden. They had a very acrimonious discussion with him. Uh, it was so acrimonious that bin Laden wrote them a letter on January 15, 2011, saying, You know, uh, I'm sorry that we. We, we were so angry last time we spoke. I, I, I want to put in writing in, in, in a letter about what we agreed to. What, what had they agreed to that the two bodyguards would leave bin Laden in July of 2011, i.e. Uh, six months after the, the receipt of this letter. Now, this is a strange letter to write. It'd be like, you know, any one of us writing to somebody we live with, but the two bodyguards lived with bin Laden on his compound. 
And so relations have become so strained that he felt he had to write a letter to formalize their agreement. And this was you know, bad news for bin Laden because he was gonna have to leave the compound. He'd have to find a new bodyguard. He was very preoccupied by this. Another thing he was preoccupied by was the US drone program, the CIA drone program, which was extremely effective about taking out leaders of Al Qaeda. Uh, it killed Saad bin Laden, one of his sons in 2009. The number three job in Al Qaeda, there was a series of number threes all, all killed in CIA drone strikes. And the, the, the letters in Abbottabad that have been discovered by, that were discovered by the Navy SEALs, uh, are, there are many examples of bin Laden saying to his family members, only travel on cloudy days if you're in the tribal regions in Pakistan. If you're gonna have a meeting, do so in a tunnel. Um, you know, he was very concerned about the drone program. He was so concerned that he was gonna move Al Qaeda to another location, potentially. He was gonna move the, what remained of Al Qaeda out of the tribal regions, either into Pakistan or into neighboring Afghanistan. That never happened, of course, he was killed. Uh, and one final preoccupation he had was, he was very preoccupied by the issue of Muslim civilian casualties. He, so, throughout all these letters to Al-Shabaab in Somalia, to Al-Qaeda in Yemen, to the Pakistani Taliban, to um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, bin Laden or his top lieutenants were constantly saying, let's stop killing Muslim civilians. And this issue became so prominent in bin Laden's mind that he was thinking of issuing a public apology on around the 10th anniversary of 9-11. It wouldn't be an apology, of course, to the United States. It would have been a, an apology to the Muslim world. It would have been an attempt to relaunch Al-Qaeda as a kinder, gentler Al-Qaeda around the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And also, of course, he was still very preoccupied with trying to kill some who attacked the United States. And he was constantly telling his affiliates, don't worry about the local jihad, You know, focus on the big enemy, the United States. He mentioned at one point, let's try and kill President Obama, let's kill try and kill David Petraeus. Don't bother with then Vice President Joe Biden because he's unprepared to be president. I'm quoting bin Laden directly here. Uh, so these were the preoccupations as he, um, in the final weeks and months of his life. And that's the way I opened the book. Uh, and then, you know, then the book starts at the beginning and then we, we kind of march through bin Laden's transformation from a shy religious teenager into the leader of Al Qaeda. And this is a process of radicalization that took decades. None of it was inevitable. There were people who intervened along the way who tried to sort of say, hey, you know, founding Al Qaeda is not a smart move. Attacking the United States is not a smart move. Um, there were lots of people, his friends, his brother-in-laws, his family members, his associates at various points who weighed in and tried to dissuade him from this path of radicalization. Of course, that, that didn't happen. I don't do a lot of armchair psychologizing in the book. I more explain how this happened, how this process of radicalization happened. And I let the reader, uh, he or she, to kind of decide kind of what, I don't, you know, what, what were the really important kind of inflection points along the way. And certainly I, you know, the death of his father when he was 10, the divorce of his parents when he was two, the invasion of the Soviet Union when he was 22, uh, the founding of Al Qaeda uh, when he started battling the Soviets himself in 1987, the formal founding of Al Qaeda in 1988, the introduction of American troops into Saudi Arabia as a result of Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, his exile in Sudan, his exile from Sudan to Afghanistan. Each one of these are kind of inflection points that pushed him further and further down the path of radicalization. So that by the time he arrives in Afghanistan in May of 1996, it's very quickly that he declares war well, formally on the United States and starts planning um, what became the 9-11 attacks. So, Vanda, I will leave it there since I think I'm at my 20-minute mark. And uh... Fantastic. Uh, uh, just tremendous opening. Uh, absolutely fascinating is this the book that I'm sure will be a riveting reading for uh, everyone. You know, you uh, in the book really give just an extraordinarily um, intimate uh, portrait of Bin Laden, and in many ways, in my view, a surprising portrait. But I would like to stay uh, with my first question to the wives, uh, which were really some, of, in my view, some of the most fascinating uh, characters in the book. And um, you know, they, they challenge um, uh, some of the sort of common perception that women in Muslim world uh, really are simply principally victims of um, uh, men in general and particular uh, terrorist men. 
or, or men who are in terrorist, who are involved with terrorism. And of course, there are um, instances of tremendous brutality, Boko Haram's treatment of women in uh, northern Nigeria, uh, and more broadly, um, uh, the treatment of women in many of these uh, very um, uh, conservative religious settings overlaid with extremist ideology. But at the same time, some of the wives, some of the women, some, some of the wives of Al Shabab Amirs um, can have surprising degree of, of power. And this, this issue that you brought up, this questioning about um, the role of Muslim civilian casualties is indeed something the terrorist group after terrorist group has struggled with from Boko Haram and Islamic State in West Africa province to Shabab. So I want to ask you about the, the wives. You know, what were their views to the extent that um, you were able to discern it about the role of islands? Were they completely comfortable with the violence? Were they hesitant? Did they try to shape it? Well, these are good questions, and some of them are not completely answerable because what we have, you know, I, all I have is the evidence in the um, in the in the documents that were recovered. I haven't spoken to the wives directly. I mean, one, I think the two wives I've mentioned so far, the two oldest wives. It's important to note, married Bin Laden, knowing that he already had another wife. So his first wife he married when she was fifteen and he was seventeen. He had eleven kids with her. She was from Syria. Uh, from an Alawite family, interestingly, we now know for a fact, um, his, yeah, a cousin of his mother. Um, now she had, I don't think, she, she married Bin Laden long before he embarked on this life of jihad. Now these two oldest wives, in this case, I think to your old point, Vanda, is, they, they married him knowing that he was involved in jihad. They married him in the mid eighties. He'd already uh, you know, been involved very in a pretty deep way in setting up the services office in Pakistan with Abdullah Razam, which was bringing all these Muslim fighters from around the world, some of whom went to Afghanistan, many of whom, the, mo the majority of whom stayed in Pakistan working as doctors and, you know, kind of accountants and cooks. And, you know, they were kind of supporting the jihad, they weren't fighting. So they got into this marriage with Bin Laden, knowing exactly who he was. And they, I think they were true believers. Um, you know, there was, uh, we, I talked to some of the Pakistani military intelligence people who had Bin Laden's three wives uh, under, if they effectively under house arrest after the Abbottabad raid. They lived in Pakistan for a year. And they said, look, there were very few things CIA and the Pakistani military intelligence service, ISI, agree on. But they do agree on one thing, which is how difficult Bin Laden's wives are. Because these, these wives were really, um, you know, they... They saw Bin Laden as a great hero of jihad. They maintained that view um, even after he was killed. Uh, they, you know, they they were true believers. And so, in the documents that were in the, I mentioned this diary. At one point, one of them, one of the, one of the wives or one of the daughters says, "Is it a problem that the Arab Spring happened without jihad?" Which is an interesting question, because of course they knew that this, you know, that they they the whole life of their husband and father, and in a sense, them, was wrapped up in the idea that change in the Middle East could only come through revolutionary violence. So, getting back to your question about, like, to what extent were they involved in violence? You know, I don't think they had any role in any planning of any terrorist attack, because we got all these, all the documents with, that involved Bin Laden's communications with <clears throat> his chief of staff, who was uh, a guy called uh, uh, Atiyah, who was a Libyan. <clears throat> there were various kind of Al Qaeda number threes, and you know, there's no the wives are not involved in any of these discussions about operations and tactics. But broadly speaking, they were supportive of Bin Laden and what he was doing. So, were they involved in actual acts of violence? Were they instigating acts of violence? Were they planning acts of violence? I don't, I don't think we have any evidence of that. Were they very supportive of what Bin Laden did? Were they helping him write his speeches? Were they helping him with his strategic thinking? They were. Yeah, fascinating. Um, and, and again, quite consistent with the far more complex role of women in um, settings of extremist violence more broadly, not simply in the uh, Muslim Salafi setting, but also in that setting. Yeah. Uh, you know, let me, I, I have sort of broader questions about not just the individuals, but really the lasting legacies and structures. But before I come to that, let me stick with one more of the more 
personal uh, questions about Bin Laden. You know, he's someone that um, you've studied for a long time. You were someone who interviewed him in 97. When you were writing, and you have written many uh, excellent uh, books in the books about him and about Al-Qaeda before, when you were writing this book, um, did you find in the research, in the readings you were doing, something that uh, really challenged your view of bin Laden up to now, whether it was at the personal level or at the sort of strategic thinking level? Was there something really striking or different that you did not expect? Well, let's start with the wives. I didn't, didn't had known, I knew that they were educated. I knew 10 years ago that they had PhDs, um, which I was surprised me then. I mean, I don't know why I was surprised, but I was. Um, but I didn't understand the extent to which they were really involved in helping him do his thinking and how reliant he was on them to do his thinking. And, you know, so that was kind of a surprise. The other surprise I think is, and I was aware of this before, but it only became clear, really clear, was the, how, myself and others have misinterpreted the role of Zawahiri. So if you go back to immediately after 9-11, the narrative, and I had this in my first book, was Zawahiri was kind of the brains of the operation. And certainly Zawahiri is a smart guy and he's a surgeon. He comes from an aristocratic, you know, upper class Egyptian family. He's been involved in jihad since he was 15. And because he appeared in a lot of these videos with bin Laden um, by his side, it appeared like he was really the number two in Al Qaeda, and there was a narrative that he was the smart one. He kind of gave Bin Laden his ideas. I, I think that is completely wrong, and I have done, I think, a big reassessment of that in the book. There's a few reasons for that. Zawahiri was focused on Egypt, which Bin Laden could care less about. In fact, somebody's done an interesting linguistic analysis, Vanda, about Bin Laden's statements. And the number one statement is about the United States, and the number two statement is about Saudi Arabia. Egypt is like, I think, number 36 in terms of rank ordering of importance of the Laden statements. So he could care less about Egypt, which was Zawahiri's big, big kind of preoccupation. And Zawahiri also, it's important to remember, and uh, Zawahiri in the run up to 9-11 was actually in jail in Dagestan for a kind of critical period in 1997, because he tried to go to Chechnya to join the Chechen kind of resistance to the Russians. And he was arrested by the Russians and put in jail. So when he showed up in Afghanistan uh, in late 1997, Zawahiri was a penniless refugee, uh, very much dependent on bin Laden, who is now the leader of all the Arabs in Afghanistan and had close relations with the Taliban. And so, you know, Zawahiri was really a supplicant. And bin Laden's big idea was to attack the United States in order for it to pull out of the Middle East. Zawahiri didn't have this idea. And also, interestingly, there is no evidence at all that Zawahiri was planning, was involved in the planning of the U.S. embassy attacks in Africa in 98, the USS Cole in 2000, or 9-11 itself. He was simply kind of informed about these things. Uh, he, his, his advice was not kind of heeded. He wasn't consulted. He wasn't involved in the planning. And so I say that part of the, one of the, for the people who care about these kind of these issues uh, on, on the more academic side, I think Z Zawahiri's role, I think has been really kind of exaggerated. And I, I would say that's a, one of the takeaways of the book is to kind of delve into that. He had very, Zawahiri is also proven to be, as we, if you know, Vander, a terrible leader of Al Qaeda. He's kind of not, he hasn't resuscitated it. It's, it's he, we haven't heard from him. There's rumors that he might be dead or certainly ill. Um, and, you know, he's, he's just not been at all an effective leader of Al-Qaeda, and he's presided over a split between Al-Qaeda and ISIS that happened in, after bin Laden died. It was a split that's been a long time coming, but I think bin Laden might have been able to paper over the differences, because even today, ISIS continues to regard, by, uh, uh, continues to regard Osama bin Laden as an important kind of leader. Uh, they, they certainly don't have that view of Zawahiri. Well, you know, very interesting uh, thoughts here, Peter, and they raise in my mind one of the fundamental questions in broader counterterrorism strategy, which is the role of decapitation. How yeah. much does it really matter whether you uh, kill the leader or, or arrest, do away with the leader? And of course, an issue that has highly varied um, outcomes. The U.S. killed Godani, the leader of Shabab in uh, 2009, had no effect on the power of um, al-Shabab, even though it changed 
some of the internal structures and dimension really didn't weaken al-Shabaab. On the other hand, the, the capture of Abimal Guzman, the leader of the Senderistas in Peru in the 1980s had, and, uh, and 1990s had really profound effect on uh, weakening um, um, uh, the Senderistas. Decapitation in Mexico has uh, uh, produced great intensification of the violence, fragmented the criminal groups, but at the same time made the criminal market very complex, very violent, very difficult to control. What is your view on uh, how significant that raid um, and killing of bin Laden was? Um, if it had happened earlier, uh, say in 2004 or five, would we have seen a different um, evolution of Al-Qaeda? Would Islamic State never arise? You know, how significant was getting uh, bin Laden from well, the larger counterterrorism perspective? I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I, uh, one of the questions I raised in the book, I mean, we had, the United States had bin Laden surrounded potentially at Tora Bora, and we now know that Jim Mattis, then Brigadier General, Marine General Jim Mattis, uh, had, he had 1,500 Marines in southern Afghanistan or in the Kandahar region. And I, I'd always had a question about what, you know, why weren't those Marines deployed to Tora Bora? And, and in Jim Mattis's recent book, he explains that he, he put a plan forward to the Pentagon to send, you know, uh, some of his uh, large contingent of his 1,500 Marines up into Tora Bora, set up observation posts, cut off bin Laden. Tora Bora is in eastern Afghanistan in a mountainous region. Bin Laden was there from late November 2001 till December 12, 2001. Um, you know, and that, that proposal just died at the Pentagon. And there was also the 10th Mountain Division in Uzbekistan, which is specializes in Alpine warfare. They were not brought in. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the big real world question is not what if we got him in 2004 or 2005 is, we really, we knew exactly where he was in, in late 2001, but we didn't, send American troops to cut, cut off Tarabora. And uh, I, you know, maybe Bin Laden would still have escaped. Tarabora, at that time, it was December. It's, you know, Tarabora is six miles by six miles long. It's, uh, the mountains go up to 14,000 feet. It was uh, snowing most of the time. Uh, there were lots of routes out into neighboring Pakistan and routes out into Afghanistan. Bin Laden knew the area well, but the point is we never tried. And could things have been different? So if Bin Laden had been caught in December or, or caught or killed in December 2001. I raised the what ifs, which are, you know, would it have been harder for the, for the Bush administration to make the argument for war with Saddam Hussein? Because one of the principal arguments was Saddam was allied to Al Qaeda. Well, that was total nonsense. But the argument would have been harder if bin Laden and much of Al Qaeda had been destroyed at the Battle of Tora Bora. Um, and, and after all, the whole war against the Taliban was because they wouldn't hand over bin Laden. So if bin Laden was, I think, found, captured, killed in December 2001, I think things might have turned out differently. Uh, the war on terror was sort of launched because the Taliban wouldn't hand over bin Laden. And that issue would have been moot. Maybe it would have been easier to do a peace deal with the Taliban. The Taliban were reaching out in 2002 to do a peace deal. They were totally defeated and we kind of ignored it. Anyway, so there's, there are some what ifs. But getting to your bigger question, Vanda, I mean, you're much more familiar with the academic literature on this, and I know there's a great debate about it. And I think you know some of it is sort of dependent on situationally dependent. I think Bin Laden, do the thought experiment where Napoleon was killed in 1811. There's, I don't think the French would have invaded Russia without the ego and ambition of Napoleon. Do the thought experiment where the 19, you know, the the plotters that tried to kill Hitler in 1944 had managed to kill him. I think World War II would have ended sooner and millions of people would have, would, have, would have survived. So there are people, I think, that change history that are sort of, it, they're leaders of such importance that it's not, it, it is important to, to capture or kill them. And I think in Bin Laden's case, there was, you know, there was a sense that of sort of justice and closure for a lot of Americans. You know, we all remember that night when President Obama came out Sunday night, uh, May 1st, 2011, at 11.25 p.m. and announced that bin Laden was killed. There was a lot of rejoicing in the United States. And it wasn't, I think, the rejoicing of, of just revenge. It was the sense of justice and some sort of closure. And the people who are you know, cheering outside the White House and in Times Square 
were kids, you know, were, were, were kids on 9-11. And for them, it was, I think, so I think that, I think it was important. Al Qaeda didn't disappear. Bin Laden's ideas didn't yeah. disappear. And uh, I know a little bit about sort of the, you know, the history that Pablo Escobar and the Cali cartel, Pablo Escobar was killed. The Cali cartel took over and, you know, in, in many ways they were worse than Escobar, at least more efficient <laughs> cocaine traffickers. So it's not a magic bullet, but I think in the case of Bin Laden, his successor, Ayman al-Zawari, has been a very incompetent leader. Um, and, and, and and I think it was useful. It, it, it demonstrated to the United States that we could, you know, carry out, you know, 10 years later, carry out an operation that brought some measure of justice to the victims of 9-11. So, of course, it didn't, and it didn't end jihadism. Jihadism is not going away. But I, I, I'll, I'll end on the following thought, Wander, you can agree or disagree. So to me, like, an interesting analog is the geographical defeat of ISIS. Um, you know, I think it was important to geographically defeat ISIS. Of course, its ideas haven't disappeared. We have ISIS-K in Afghanistan. We had a, an attack in New Zealand by somebody inspired by ISIS just a few days ago, and he tried to kill a few people. Um, so, but once the geographical caliphate disappeared, ISIS's appeal also disappeared for a, a lot. There was no longer, you know, tens of thousands of Muslim foreign fighters going into Iraq and Syria getting training, and and, and it was less inspirational. So. Whether it's you know the kind of destruction of a geographical caliphate like what happened with ISIS or the decapitation of an important leader, um, I do think they have psychological effects that are important uh, on on weakening these organizations. Well, um, perfect. That's actually great uh, transition to my last question before we go to the questions from audience, which is about the legacy of Bin Laden and legacy of Al Qaeda. So Bin Laden is dead um, a decade now, just about. Um, and um, um, Al Qaeda has been very weakened in very, very many other ways. You spoke about the drone attacks at various middle level uh, uh, Al Qaeda commanders, the killing of some of the children of Bin Laden who were um, uh, critical fighters uh, in the terrorist group. And you had then the rise of ISIS that for a while achieved um, far more than Al Qaeda did. It did have a caliphate that um, Bin Laden dreamed about, but never got. ISIS got a caliphate. Uh, and yet we still see uh, many jihadi groups, Salaf jihadi groups that are sticking with Al Qaeda, that they have to make the choice in embracing, aligning at least, at least metaphorically, ideologically with um, uh, Al Qaeda or um, uh, ISIS, they stick with ISIS. Uh, sorry, they stick. They're still with Al Qaeda. You no, know, Shabab is one of the most prominent example here. What is it that um, Bin Laden, Al Qaeda, um, for the past decade, decade and a half, have been providing in terms of inspiration, in terms of support? You know, wh why is it that the group still has such significance in the mind of jihadists, many of whom, like uh, uh, some of the uh, students at, in Arizona and in the United States, will have been born after 9-11, for whom that, that uh, uh, tremendous event is just a distant memory? Yeah. Um... Well, I think you know one thing that Bin Laden, Bin Laden had a big idea, which um, the big idea was the, the problems in the Muslim world are caused by the United States, um, and the, this is a big idea that has the advantage that it it sort of it it, it worked for Bin Laden because, it, for instance, when he was in Sudan, he had Egyptians and Libyans and Tunisians and all these different groups that were involved in local jihads. And this big idea, could, they could all unite around. They all agreed the United States was a bad thing. Um, and sort of, he set them in a particular direction. And I think so. I think this big idea that Bin Laden had, no matter how kind of uh, inaccurate it is, uh, was, you know, useful. Uh, and, and it continues to be an idea that has some, some valence in, in, around the world. I don't think it has much as much valence as it used to. If you look at public opinion polling on support for Bin Laden and his ideas, it, it kind of tapered over time. And if you look at support for suicide bombing, which has been kind of the you know a kind of hallmark of Al Qaeda, that in the Muslim world, support for that tactic has declined precipitously because so many of the victims have been Muslim civilians. But that said, we're about a you know if we'd had this conversation a year ago, Vanda, I think. I would be a lot more upbeat 
but we're not having this conversation here for now. We have, you know, Siraj Akhani, who is very close to Al Qaeda, has just been named the Minister of Interior, which would be uh, of Afghanistan, which is like putting Bernie Madoff in charge of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States, or putting John Gotti in charge of the FBI. I mean, it's it's kind of a crazy. The Ministry of the Interior in Afghanistan is like a mixture of Department of Homeland Security and the FBI mixed together. And Siraj Akhani is, you know, very close to Al Qaeda and he's now in charge. So there is going to be another iteration of this. And it's not it's not existential in nature to the West or it's a big problem for Afghanistan, neighboring countries. Uh, but you know, the, these ideas, and this has been Laden's legacy, getting back to your question, these ideas are going to be, they, they kind of linger, partly because they say, they, they pretend that God is on their side, or they believe that God is on, the, on their side, and it's hard to abolish God if you know, you know, the other waves of, of terrorism have peaked and declined over time. This religious wave of terrorism, I think, is going to be around for quite a long time. You can never really defeat it. You can just sort of manage it so it's not a big issue. Um, and we've done a pretty good job. The United States and its allies have done a pretty good job of managing. I think with Afghanistan, we've made a huge unforced error that's going to just continue this story for many, many years in the future, not forever, because the Taliban are going to do something dumb at a certain point in the United States, whether it's President Biden or President Mala Harris or President Marco Rubio, some president in the future, is going to change. Is going to put troops back in uh, because the Taliban are engaging in ethnic cleansing, or they're killing Americans, or there's a terrorist attack against a Western target traceable to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, you know, something may change. Um, and, and you know, right now, the Taliban are in control. They're, in control, they're stronger than they've ever been. Uh, but I, I don't think that that's going to be forever. So I have been monitoring the questions in the chat. Let me pick up the last one that just came in. Who, in your view, is now sort of the symbolic equivalent of bin Laden in the terrorist landscape? And you don't necessarily have to limit it to uh, just Salafi terrorism. Is there anyone like uh, bin Laden? Is there anyone like Abimael Guzman, who in the 70s and 80s had this large mythical, almost like role and impacted uh, uh, leftist terrorist groups in other parts of the world, the Che Guevara equivalents. So I want here is not it. We know from you. Is there anyone else who would rise to that stature? There isn't. So uh, let me take another question uh, then is which was um, uh, about um, the role of Pakistan and um, the, the, the closeness between Al Qaeda and Pakistan. You know, however, um, uh, disappointing the outcome in Afghanistan is um, it's to some extent to a very important extent though not the sole one the outcome of uh, two things one the, the terrible leadership of Afghan politicians and government for the past 20 years and the inability of the United States to dissuade Pakistan from supporting the Taliban uh, but the Taliban relationship with Pakistan is quite different than its relationship with Al-Qaeda can you uh, give us your sense on the Pakistan, Al Qaeda, Pakistan, Bin Laden relationship and the complexities of that? Yeah, well, a common view is that Pakistan must have known that Bin Laden was living in Abbottabad, a, a mile away from their, their equivalent of West Point. And I can tell you that based on a review of all the documents that were recovered, there's just no evidence for that. Um, you know, Bin Laden was hiding from people on the compound, forget about, you know, informing Pakistani officials where he was. Uh, one of the bodyguards' wives didn't know Osama bin Laden was hiding on the compound, so he was being very careful about his sort of personal security. And there's no evidence that, the, that any Pakistani official knew where bin Laden was. He was not in communication with any Pakistani officials. Um, and, you know, it's hard to prove negatives, but there's just simply no evidence, despite people like Sai Hirsch and others who claimed that somehow Pakistanis must have known, did know that he was in this compound in Abbottabad. And Al-Qaeda, you, you you probably recall, tried to kill President Musharraf on two occasions, two very serious assassination attempts in the 2003-2004 time period. They also handed over Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9-11. They also handed uh, over Al-Libi, who became the number three of Al-Qaeda in 2005. 
So you know, Al Qaeda was very suspicious of the Pakistanis, and uh, in the in, in the documents they referred to the Pakistani military as as infidels. They did contemplate having some kind of ceasefire with the Pakistani government, and they talked to the Pakistani Taliban, which has links to the Pakistani government, about negotiating some kind of ceasefire. Nothing came of these talks, and and that was it. Um, so you know, Pakistan obviously has long-standing links to the Akani network, which is effectively the most important part of the Taliban now from a military perspective. Uh, and that's what really counts. And we had the head of ISI visiting Kabul uh, just in the last three days. I think that visit kind of speaks for itself. Um, but Al-Qaeda was not, you know, there's no evidence of Al-Qaeda in the Pakistan sort of having any relationship with any real on the military level, on the on the government level, there's just there's just nothing there. Yeah, and, and the issue of Sirajuddin Haqqani having MOI, the Minister of Interior, um, I suspect that's not at all surprising and very much has to do with Pakistani's interest in uh, Afghanistan, including getting uh, Pakistan's hand on lots of the intelligence of uh, NDS and other actors. So I actually thought that was a very predictable. Uh, appointment if however distressing uh, to to take place uh, you know I, I clearly am not the only person who was struck by the role of the wives and one of the questions that came in um, is um, uh, to ask you to elaborate on in what ways are the bin laden wives uh, difficult or why did pakistan find them difficult and what has happened with the wives since the time they were held uh, in pakistan for that year well i think when they said they were different, they were not cooperative, which is not necessary. According to the Pakistani military intelligence officials I spoke to, they were hostile uh, and, and difficult and not cooperative, which is not surprising. Their husband had just been killed in an operation and you know, they probably were, but they didn't, they, they were not particularly helpful. Uh, they, they were uh, interrogated. Uh, there was one of the documents I relied on is the Abbottabad Commission, which Al Jazeera leaked. I got a leaked version of their report, which is actually a pretty useful kind of document about where bin Laden was at any given point after 9-11 when he was in Pakistan. Uh, so they were under house arrest in Pakistan, then they were sent back, they were sent to Saudi Arabia, they lived in Saudi Arabia, they're not talking to anybody, you know, they're just, they're, the bin Laden family, I'm sure, is supporting them in some shape or form. Um, they, they've been given no statements, I don't anticipate them giving any statements. Um, and uh, they're living a very quiet life in Saudi Arabia now. So, uh, you know, as we are winding to concluding this absolutely uh, terrific conversation that I am certain, um, uh, a fascinating one that I'm certain everyone will rush off immediately to buy uh, the book and I encourage everyone to do so. Um, let me put on sort of the kind of last um, legacy significance question. What is your assessment of, of Al-Qaeda uh, today? And what is your assessment um, broadly of the, the, the global terrorism picture? So you spoke about uh, that you expect that the US will at some point be, be sending troops to um, Afghanistan. At the same time, um, the Trump administration withdrew uh, uh, troops from um, Somalia. We are still conducting um, air drone strikes attacks there. There is still some U.S. Uh, presence in uh, Niger and in Mali, but uh, President Macron is very keen to uh, wrap up the French presence in Mali, Fran France being the principal uh, military actor to challenge Islamic State in Maghreb, um, Al-Qaeda in Maghreb, and uh, various Islamic Jihadi affiliates in, um, in Mali. So, you know, are, are we on this 20th uh, anniversary of 9-11 um, uh, heading into different uh, approach toward 9-11 that will be, so the different approach toward terrorism rather, that will be far less oriented toward uh, very extensive, very frequent military deployments and focus far more on defenses closer to home? Yeah, I mean, I think that presidents is different as George W. Bush, President Obama, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, all kind of came to the same place uh, in different ways about the about the, que the question you're asking, Vanda, which is they understand that sending large armies into the Middle East doesn't make a lot of sense, isn't politi politically is sustainable. And they have sort of defaulted to kind of drone, drone warfare, 
cyber warfare, um, the use of special operations and the use of special forces. And I think that that has proven a pretty successful playbook. It does, it doesn't, you're not gonna ex exterminate or totally defeat these groups because this ideology will continue to survive and Bin Laden was an important component of creating the ideology. Um, and you know, these groups prey on weak hosts. It's not that they're strong themselves. So, so whether it's in, in Yemen or Somalia or, or Afghanistan or pick your Muslim country with a failed or failing state, they're, you know, they're gonna have a presence and they're, they're not, sometimes they do well and sometimes you know, Al Qaeda in Yemen at one point controlled significant parts of Yemen, Al Shabaab in Somalia at one point controlled a good chunk of Somalia. That's not true, true today. So I just see them sort of these groups kind of waxing and waning depending on local circumstances. I think the United States response will be similar. And you know, it, it's all a matter of degree. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you know, we still have 2,500 troops in Iraq. We just relabeled them non-combat troops in order for it to be politically palatable for the sort of Shia political parties in Iraq. And you know, they will be there. And they, you know, one of the great successes we had, which isn't really, I think, publicly acknowledged enough, is the United States trained the Iraqi counterterrorism service, which did all the fighting against ISIS and has proven to be an extremely successful special forces, special operations for the Iraqi military. And so I think that we'll just, this is how we're going to continue. Um, and you you point to, you know, kind of a pullback. I'm, 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 and I'm sure the, you know, everybody wants to pull back, but somehow we always get pulled back, you know, pulled the other way. Every president since Jimmy Carter has sort of, ex except with the exception of George H.W. Bush, has sort of been pulled into Afghanistan for one reason or another. Um, and I, whether it's President Joe Biden or his successor, um, I anticipate that he or her uh, may well put, be pulled back for some of the same reasons if, if the Taliban do all the things I think they're very likely to do. Well, uh, I'm uh, hoping that perhaps we'll have opportunities to be exploring some of these issues, such as training partner capacity, building a partner capacity in the follow-up panel. But I want to thank you, Peter, so much for just the terrific uh, conversation. Uh, it's always great uh, hearing you. It's always great reading you. The rise and fall of Osama bin Laden is just a brilliant book. Um, very hearty congratulations and thank you for writing it and for spending the time with us today. Well, thank you. Hector, much. over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. What a phenomenal discussion and we could just go on for hours. Uh, thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. I know you have a busy agenda today. Uh, we're really, really grateful and honored to have you join us today uh, for this first session of our 9-11 event. I'd like to turn over to session two now at this time. But before I do so, again, for those who've joined us, we have about over 170 participants in the call. So great turnout. Encourage you all to continue to post your questions in the chat box. Uh, and just to encourage you all to go to our website at the GordonInstitute.fiu.edu so you could see some of our upcoming programming. For instance, tomorrow, September 9th, we will be hosting a panel on the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake from 1230 to 2 o'clock. Encourage you to see that. It's a phenomenal panel of, of folks who are on the ground uh, taking advantage and, and looking into the uh, Haiti relief efforts. Also, I encourage you to look at our National Security Workshop series that will take place this fall 2021 uh, semester with agencies from uh, the FBI, representatives from the FBI, National Counterterrorism Center, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, among others. And last but not least, the Gordon Institute's uh, Insider's Guide to Careers in National Security and Intelligence taking place on October 1st. Now at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our second panel. But before I do so, I'd like to formally introduce our panelists and our moderator. Dr. Eric Edelman is the former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, U.S. Ambassador to Turkey, U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Finland, and Principal Deputy Assistant to the Vice President for National Security Affairs. Dr. Edelman is Distinguished Practitioner in Residence at the Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced and International Studies, as a, and also serves as a counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments and a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center for Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. Of course, you just heard from Dr. Venda Felva Brown, who did a fantastic job moderating our first session. Uh, for those of you who weren't able to uh, uh, hear my introduction for her in the first uh, top of the hour, Dr. 
Van Dafelba Brown is a senior fellow in the Center for Security and Strategy and Technology in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Um, she's the director of the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors and is also the co-director of the Africa Security Initiative. Among her many notable appointments, Dr. Philba Brown was a senior advisor to the congressionally mandated Afghanistan Peace Process Study Group. Dr. Mohamed Omoyanovic is a research professor at Florida International University, author and expert in international security and strategic studies with a focus on nuclear strategy, counterproliferation, arms control, and disarmament. Certainly, last but not least, is Dr. Alexander Crowther. Dr. Crowther was personally selected to be the counterterrorism advisor to the US ambassador to Iraq. He was a political advisor for the multinational corps, uh, Iraq commander, and served as a special assistant for the Supreme Allied Commander, Europe. He's also our visiting professor, research professor at FIU. This panel will be moderated by a uh, senior fellow at the FIU Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs, Baklav Havel Program for Human Rights and Diplomacy, and the director of the European and Eurasian Studies Program and former Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, our good friend, David J. Kramer. Let me turn it over to this fine panel on what will certainly be a tremendous follow-up discussion. David, over to you. Hector, thanks so much. And my sincere thanks to you and your great team at the Gordon Institute for pulling all this together. We have a tough act to follow in the second panel after a fascinating conversation that Vanda had with, with Peter. So a huge thanks for kicking us off in such a, a good way. Um, what I wanna do is, is turn to the panel right away and start with, with Eric Edelman, if I can, and ask each of you um, to explain from your various vantage points how it is we went from 9-11 and the global war on terrorism to where we are today with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uncertainty in the Middle East. Um, give us your sense of, of how we, we got to this point. Eric, let's start with you, please. Uh, well, thank you, David. And it's great to be here and, and uh, be on this distinguished uh, panel. Um, I uh, only got to hear a little bit of Peter Bergen's uh, talk with uh, Dr. Felda Brown, but I, I agreed with everything I heard him say, and I'll maybe repeat some of uh, what he said in my own comments. Um, look, if you had asked me um, on 9-11, when I spent most of the day in the Presidential Emergency Operations Center uh, in the White House, uh, that we would go for 20 years without another mass casualty attack in the United States. Uh, I, I you know, would have been highly uh, doubtful about um, what substances you'd been ingesting. Um, I, uh, and particularly in the immediate days after uh, the uh, threat reporting, and I think it's important because part of the answer to your question of how did we get to where we are today uh, from where we were on September 12th, 2001, is that there's been a lot of uh, a lot of amnesia and and a lot of generational change. Um, you know, when you think about the 13 Marines who were uh, and uh, Navy corpsmen who were tragically killed uh, at the airport at uh, Hamid Karzai International Airport uh, at the end of last month, most of them uh, either weren't alive or were infants uh, on on 9/11. Um, so going back to put oneself into the mindset of where we were uh, in the immediate aftermath and in the months afterwards, and we had the, uh, not only the, uh, the attacks uh, in New York and, and Washington, um, we had as well the anthrax attacks, the provenance of which I think we're still quite uncertain about, despite the FBI's certainty that um, that they think it was uh, the late Dr. Bruce Irwin at um, Fort Detrick. Um, that's not been conclusively demonstrated, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so we had a lot of uncertainty about, about that. Um, we had a false positive reading of ricin at the White House in October of 2001, uh, which was unsettling to say the least. So if you had told me we weren't gonna have, you know, mass casualty attack, I, I would have been quite surprised. And 
you know, since then, I think there's some things we've done well and there's some things we've done less well. Uh, one of the things I think we've done well is uh, tuned up our counterterrorism capabilities uh, into a very formidable um, uh, apparatus uh, with uh, ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, drone strikes, as, as uh, Peter was mentioning, cyber and special operations forces, although there's some downsides uh, to the use of special operations forces, which we can come back and talk about. And with those capabilities, we've done enormous damage to Al-Qaeda, to Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, and of course to ISIS uh, in the counter-ISIS campaign of 2014 to, to 2017, 2018. Um, what I think we haven't done so well at uh, is finding a politically sustainable posture. Um, I, I give a lot of credit to uh, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter uh, and his successor, Jim Mattis, who I think uh, were finding a kind of uh, equilibrium in uh, Northeastern Syria and Iraq. Uh, and I think we're hoping to be able to develop something similar uh, ultimately in Afghanistan. But I think we've run out of uh, the American public's uh, patience uh, here. Um, and I think that's been you know, a, a challenge for us that uh, obviously played out last month. Um, one thing I think we particularly um, have failed at, and it's almost an identical failure to the one we uh, had in Vietnam, is uh, building the capacity of our partners. I mean, one reason why the Afghan National Security Forces failed is we built them to operate and fight the way we do, with massive information dominance, uh, with uh, overwhelming air power, uh, with contract logistics to keep uh, both fixed wing and air, air and rotary wing aircraft in the air and uh, vehicles moving uh, on the road. And then when we pulled that all out, we wondered why they didn't, you know, have, quote, the will to fight anymore, um, despite the fact that they had taken, you know, 66,000 killed in action uh, over a, a decade. Um, this is a, a replay, uh, essentially, of what we did in Vietnam with the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Um, I'm, I'm one of the few people in the U.S. government who has the distinction of having had Bob Comer as a, a predecessor at two jobs. Uh, uh, Secretary Comer was both my predecessor, many times removed as Undersecretary of Defense and also as Ambassador to Turkey, where he had a short but lively uh, tenure, which we could talk about if you want. Um, but he wrote a, a study for RAND um, in 1972 called Bureaucracy Does Its Thing which recounts how we uh, turned the Army of the Republic of Vietnam into a miniature US Army and which was destined to fail in the kind of conflict in which it, it was engaged. Um, two other comments and then I'll uh, stop. Um, uh, one is that uh, one area where we have, in my view, failed totally uh, as a government, as a society has been in, um, combating uh, the ideology that underpins uh, violent Islamic extremism. And, uh, you know, many of the general officers involved uh, in the um, struggle of the last 20 years, like General Petraeus and others have said repeatedly, we can't kill our way out of uh, this uh, conflict. Uh, there are some hardcore terrorists who have to be killed, but the, um, the longer term uh, problem is to defeat this ideology. Um, and uh, after 20 years, I'm sorry to say we're, uh, you know, nowhere close to even beginning to do that. Um, and as a result of that, uh, today, despite all the um, uh, activities that Peter Bergen was talking about and that I was mentioning in my comments, we, we face more jihadists in more places in the world than we did on 9-11. Um, and I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge. And then finally, I would say one, one thing we definitely have suffered from over the last 20 years is opportunity cost, uh, because I think we were very slow while we were preoccupied by um, our dealing with terrorists and, and uh, struggles in uh, Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan uh, with the rise of a revanchist Russia uh, and uh, a China that uh, you know, was committed to its peaceful rise, but has become increasingly aggressive over the last 
decade in the South China Sea, East China Sea, and elsewhere. Um, and um, that's something we're now struggling to make up for. Eric, terrific. Thanks very much. Um, Vanda, if we can go to you, please, for your, your take on from 9-11 to where we are now. Well, thank you very much. And um, fascinating comments by the uh, undersecretary. Uh, now, let me pick up on where we are before I get to how we got there and to just add some of the elements of where we are. So in addition to, of course, um, uh, not having suffered a massive uh, attack in the homeland, uh, perhaps uh, painful attacks from so-called lone wolves, certainly nothing uh, that would uh, uh, that would approach the, the scale of the horror and of the shock of 9-11, uh, we have also built up tremendous amount of homeland security uh, systems and, and an apparatus that wasn't there 20 years ago, and that's very much part of our life, present in every dimension of our life, whether we're conscious of it or not. And the balancing of the need to defend against terrorism, of course, came with very difficult, very complex costs about the issues of civil liberties, uh, human rights, legacies that we are still grappling with and that remain um, a significant element of uh, all thinking about counterterrorism strategies. And we have also seen um, a significant rise in uh, domestic extremism that is not linked to, um, uh, to jihad, that's about, or at least not directly linked to jihad, that is about issues like white supremacy, about county supremacy, about dissatisfaction with the basic structure of the government, and, but that links to uh, the war against terrorism, the global war against terrorism, because many of its key organizers, logistical actors are in fact uh, vets uh, that have not been able to transition to life after deployments, um, often very grueling, very brutal, very difficult deployments from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Somalia. And so the linkage between being effective at least to some extent in suppressing um, extremist violence abroad so it doesn't impact on the homeland has come with uh, another dimension, which is dealing with uh, uh, new, uh, new violence, new extremism uh, at home. Now, I would also say that, um, uh, you know, Undersecretary Edelman was uh, uh, absolutely correct in about the struggles of building partner capacity, a, a vulnerability that uh, was on display when the Afghan security forces melted in 10 days, in 10 days. But then we are also dealing uh, in with many other um, places. So the counterterrorism, the, the sort of golden division of Iraq, the counterterrorism, uh, force uh, in the country that is now assessed as being the most effective element of the Iraqi forces wasn't able to cope with the rise of uh, the Islamic State and its original spread in 2014 and critically had to rely on the Hashets, the Hashd al-Shabi, the, the militias. And it took a lot of soul searching and redoing and trying to refurbish the golden division, the counterterrorism division after it was not coping originally with uh, the Islamic State. Uh, and in Somalia, we are essentially in a predicament that's um, akin to where we were in um, Afghanistan until recent weeks, namely that um, the capacities to build up the Somali national forces um, have, uh, are still very limited. The buildup is, the, the force is extremely ineffective. Uh, and uh, the Amisom forces have become um, stale at best. They are really not changing the environment. They are hanging on with the knowledge that if they withdraw, Shabab will be able to retake very large parts of Somalia, um, south of Atlanta and even uh, other parts like Almadouk. And yet uh, the, the, the term that was used for Afghanistan for so many years, the degrading stalemate, um, is also on display in Somalia. I would say it's not even a degrading stalemate. It's just steady losses to Al-Shabaab and steady inability of the training of the SNA to overcome the deficiencies, the rifts, the parochialism uh, that plague it. Now, I would say that even bigger problem and really the fundamental struggle of the global war on terrorism as it has been conceived and as it has been executed over the past 20 years is really the inability to shape our partners. 
And the fact that groups like Shabab and Taliban and Boko Haram and the Islamic State in West Africa province are seemingly so strong, it's really just the mirror of the fact that the local governments engage in such miserable parochial misgovernance where uh, issues of corruption and self-interest constantly trump um, the most basic national interest or what should be the most na basic national interest, which is of regime survival. And often do so because they assume that the external power, the United States will bail them out. And so I see these dynamics in places like Nigeria, in places like Somalia, certainly in, in Afghanistan and elsewhere, where the politics and politicking constantly continues to undermine and weaken, um, not just the, the, the effort against the Islamic groups, but the very, uh, very capacity of the, of the regime uh, to survive. Incidentally, Niger are um, uh, other instances. And so we never really developed that, uh, that magical wand of how do you make your presumed partners to start not giving up corruption, not giving up parochialism, but just reduce it enough to make the regime uh, be preserved. And I don't think that we uh, have that answer. And so uh, as my last comment, one of the effects, of course, of these deficiencies uh, of the government and the legacy of where we are today is the steady rise of militia actors and, um, and increasing perception that militias are the answer to the states that are so deficient and the struggles of uh, the building up the, the formal partner capacity, the formal security sector. Uh, they are both seen as the solution by the governments uh, themselves that they don't want to uh, have to alter uh, the grievances they, they generate, they don't want to have to alter the behavior, so they stop producing fewer grievances, very comfortable by relying that it's all about ideology and not about their own action. And they are also seen uh, as the solution by many external actors, not simply powers like the United States or, or Russia, uh, but also regional powers. But I would posit that, uh, that the militias often are not the solution and they are uh, a problem in the making, the problem that already exists. And they succumb to all the same problems of um, uh, unreliability, lack of capacity, high willingness to switch alliances, including toward their presumed enemies. And that in fact, what we are heading to is a, is a world where um, uh, the state is much weaker all the more so uh, after COVID, and where the non-state actors will be far more complex and will be engaging with them in far more complex and distressing way than simply uh, be combating them. Okay. Wanda, terrific. Thanks so much uh, for that. Um, Mohammed, let me turn to you next, please, if I can. Thank you so much, David. Uh, so to follow up on the uh, comments of previous speakers, um, I could just point to maybe a couple of factors that I see uh, negatively impacted how the global on terrorism, the so-called GWAT, didn't uh, unfold as planned. One, I think there is a uh, structural problems with the, with the Middle East uh, as a region that uh, the United States actually did not do too much to address and maybe remedy. Uh, we're talking about uh, a bunch of, you know, uh, countries, states that are not uh, organically strong states. So if you think about the Middle East outside of uh, Iran, Egypt, and Turkey, uh, you really don't have uh, a lot of uh, strong states in traditional sense that, uh, that are coherent in a political, you know, societal sense. But we also have a very shallow rooted tenuous and I would argue a little bit of ad hoc order, uh, which if you, when you combine with these fragile and failure prone states uh, without any institutional region wide security framework, uh, conflicts are you know, prone to, to escalate and non state actors have a much easier time than other regions in the world uh, to operate uh, with freedom. So, uh, so that's uh, problem number one, uh, which is a structural problem with the region. But I think it may be more important than that was uh, the fact that uh, this entire paradigm of the global war on terrorism, I think was poorly uh, conceptualized. Uh, right from the get go, I think we use the language of a long war 
uh, very explicitly in order to compare it to the Cold War, in a sense, as a type of you know, zero-sum global scale generational struggle against these anti-liberal ideological extremists who wanted to rule the world. Uh, and both you know, the global war on terrorism and the Cold War were uh, staged as a defense of the West or Western civilization, if you will, against those who, were, who wanted you know, to destroy it. Um, I remember that Donald Rumsfeld famously once said that, you know, uh, of the terrorists, that they will either succeed in changing our way of life or we will succeed in changing theirs. So uh, one wonders if, uh, you know, uh, terrorism and transnational, you know, radical Islam was ever capable of offering a dominant, a dominant you know, unifying idea that would enable the West to, to reassert and uh, you know, legitimize its leadership uh, of global security. And then you know, number three, I, uh, I sometimes wonder about the relationship uh, between uh, intelligence, policy, politics, and ideology within that broader context of the global war on terrorism. Uh, was there almost right from the get-go too much politics and ideology in policy formulation and even in the intelligence cycle? And uh, did that compromise or negatively impact the quality of uh, policymaking, but also you know, the quality of implementation uh, of those policies? Also, you know, implementation, I think, uh, is an issue that maybe we need to address. Because if you look at uh, US military expenditure, even today, it remains largely aimed at meeting traditional challenges uh, from other state actors, uh, with only a small fraction of, uh, of that budget allocated for, uh, for non-state actors. And uh, I think that uh, speaks maybe to the fact that the main significance of the global war on terrorism, at least in its initial formation, was much more political than, uh, than the Cold War. Uh, because the Cold War uh, was pretty much US grand strategy in a very deep sense. The global war on terrorism, I would argue was not and still is not. Uh, and a brief glance at the you know, at UN, uh, United uh, States national security strategy of 2006, if you look at it, uh, will show that the global war on terrorism was being promoted as if it were U.S. grand strategy. But uh, like I said, I'm quite skeptical of, uh, of that assertion. And uh, the global war on terrorism's promotion to Cold War type grand strategy uh, did not succeed because I believe that the type of language of existential threat that was being utilized by, the, uh, by some segments of the US national security apparatus to justify this full multi-generational mobilization of, uh, of the US military in pursuit of that global war on terrorism was, uh, was not justified. And lastly, uh, I believe that uh, also the global war on terrorism maybe was, uh, was hijacked, uh, maybe that's too strong a term, but was at least uh, misused maybe by, uh, by the neocons in pursuit of a missionary regime change policy, ostensibly in pursuit of democracy. And, uh, and that maybe uh, you know, derailed the global one terrorism from the type of, uh, of a more specific, narrow focused uh, you know, uh, type of policy track that it needed to be kept on. Mohammed, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that. Um, Alex, over to you, and then uh, we'll come back to the panel. Thank you, David. Uh, it's uh, wonderful working with fellow professionals. Uh, I agree with almost everything everybody said. Um, so uh, when Eric was at the White House on 9-11, I was in the Pentagon on 9-11. It was a very long day, followed by three months of even longer days when we uh, essentially planned the global war on terror. So the global war on terror originally was actually very circumscribed. Um, 
<clears throat> it was uh, it was cast as Muhammad said in in terms of a generational struggle, but it was uh, it was very circumscribed in, in that our, our orders were you know who the bad guys are, figure out how to go get them right. It didn't didn't involve uh, everything that it morphed into. So we made we the United States and our allies and partners made a series of really bad decisions along the way. Right, the first one was to go into nation building in Afghanistan. It started at the Bonn Conference in December of 01 and codified by President Bush at a VMI uh, address in April of 02. Uh, and so we had succeeded in punishing the Taliban. We had succeeded in, uh, in taking out their regime and uh, essentially sidelining Osama bin Laden. Um, and then all of a sudden a new mission appeared, right? Nation building, which is not a military mission, right? The military can help to create the environment uh, for political uh, consolidation, but, uh, but, but can't deliver uh, by itself, right? Then our decision to invade Iraq uh, was uh, problematic for two reasons. Uh, number one, uh, Afghanistan was uh, authorized by the, um, by the UN Security Council. Uh, Iraq was not, right? And so this really delegitimized our efforts uh, in the eyes of the world. The other thing is it di di distracted us from Afghanistan, uh, which allowed ev uh, eventually the Taliban uh, to come back. Um, we also suffered from a lack of desire to understand the culture in the areas that we were working in. Um, uh, as Eric talked about, you know, the we didn't challenge the ideology, right? That's because we really didn't want to understand the ideology and its conceptual no problem, all. pardon me um so uh for instance uh choosing the type of democracy you know a lockean jeffersonian democracy focused on the individual just doesn't work in countries like iraq or afghanistan a top-down centralized government in Afghanistan doesn't work both demographically and geographically, right? And so these were decisions that that uh, really hurt us. What was your name, sir? And then the uh, the last one was really was uh, was human rights violations uh, in places like Guantanamo Bay, uh, as Vanda stated. Uh, she talked about human rights violations and. Uh, and that really hurt us, right? Uh, we were we went from the French president saying we're all Americans now to people in Iraq and Afghanistan and other countries say, uh, identifying us as crusader occupiers who were looking to destroy their cultures. Uh, and the, uh, the other one, Eric talked about patience, right? The American people ran out of patience. I think that uh, our political leaders didn't explain it to the American people uh, well enough or often enough to maintain American patience because the American public will will support stuff like this, but you got to explain it to them. You got to get them on board. And I think, and this isn't a Democrat or Republican thing. This is a, a American elite leadership thing. Uh, they just didn't bother to explain it. People didn't, we didn't raise taxes uh, to bring people on board, nothing like that. Uh, and so uh, I agree with Eric on that one in that uh, the American people lost patience. Um, and I think, honestly, the American government just lost focus on stuff like this. It wasn't that important anymore. So we took our ball and we went home. Alex, thanks very much. Uh, look, all four of you have made really interesting comments and um, some even provocative comments. So I do want to give each of you a quick opportunity if you want to respond to any, but I'll add a question to each of you as we go along. Uh, Eric, let me let me start with you. Our, our mutual friend Bob Kagan recently wrote a piece in the Washington Post arguing that we went into Afghanistan not out of a sense of hubris, but out of a sense of fear. Uh, it, for the reasons you laid out, we weren't sure what was coming next. In fact, we expected there would be more. Um, but as Alex also pointed out, Iraq, uh, to many people, took our eye off the ball of what we should have focused on in Afghanistan. Can you maybe respond to that issue and any other comments you want to make, uh, if we could do it quickly, though, so we can get around? You're, you're, you're on mute, Eric. Thank you. I mean, I, I sometimes sound better on mute. Um, so, um, you know, 
it'll be interesting, I think, uh, when historians, you know, get at this, and they're beginning to, I mean, the first, I think, serious history of Afghanistan has just been uh, written by my colleague at SICE and former Foreign Service colleague, Carter Mulcazian. Um, I think actually uh, the idea that we took our eye off the ball is actually a bit of a myth. I mean, uh, that, that's been propagated by others. I mean, the truth is um, we made some mistakes in terms of the pursuit of bin Laden, but I don't think they really had much to do with Iraq and, and Tommy Franks, the commander of CENTCOM at the time has said as much. Uh, he resisted additional troops coming in. He chose to rely on, um, on surrogates in Afghanistan, which I think was a mistake uh, because we allowed ourselves essentially to be subject to their, um, you know, their issues rather than ours. Uh, and I think that, uh, made the pursuit of, Afga of uh, uh, bin Laden in Afghanistan and into Pakistan um, a bit of a fool's errand for us. We, we you know, could have perhaps accomplished it. I don't think we needed the 10th Mountain Division there to do it. I don't think it was actually a, a troop issue and I don't think it really had to do with Iraq. I mean, we were slow in picking up the fact that the insurgency was regrouping, that the Taliban was regrouping but I, I honestly think that had more to do with uh, lack of understanding uh, of Afghanistan um, and of the Taliban itself than it did with, with, with anything else, honestly. Vanda, let me turn to you if you wanna pick up on any of the comments that have been made and, and ask you the question about uh, nation building. Alex mentioned it. Of course, President Biden uh, cited it as, as a reason we shouldn't have maintained a military force in Afghanistan. That was not its purpose. But if we were to just go in and eliminate the threat in Afghanistan and then leave, would that have been the responsible thing to do as well? So if you could, uh, any comments you want to make? Well, that's an excellent question. And I think that's the core dilemma of the counterterrorism uh, efforts abroad over the past 20 years. And it's a core dilemma that will remain even if we move toward a pullback that's much more focused on the geostrategic threat of Russia and China and not uh, preoccupied to that great extent with uh, local uh, terrorism issues and local stability. So first of all, I am not really fond of the term nation building. Uh, sometimes it is in fact nation building in a country like Afghanistan or Somalia or for that matter, Northern Nigeria. Um, the issue is really not building a nation, but building a state, a state that is sufficiently effective in providing order and uh, government uh, decent enough that it uh, remove some of the core entrenchment possibilities for, um, for um, groups and uh, for not state armed actors, for terrorist groups. And um, that doesn't make it any easier, uh, but, but it's all part of sort of the, the, the methodologizing and the, the narrative that, that I think are um, very unhelpful in how we think about those problems. So, you know, it's not really about nation building, it's about building effective states, or at least effective enough in being able to uh, deliver more order, more security uh, than uh, the terrorist groups and perhaps more services. And the bar is really very low and it's really striking how despite the fact that the bar is so low, um, we have not been able to through institutional reform measure, SSR um, reforms, uh, our political pressures induce local governments to uh, change their behavior enough so the state is not so pernicious, not so absent, not so grating. And we see this in uh, other contexts, not simply in the Islamic context, in Latin America as well. The flip side, however, is, so if counterterrorism policy becomes only about um, uh, the destruction of a certain set of leaders, is that going to be sufficient? And uh, I will it probably not. So we might be in a state where is it good enough to disrupt the group sufficiently and frequently enough to minimize uh, or at least reduce the extent of threat and capacity to conduct attacks, perhaps 
is it going to eliminate the group? Well, potentially not. And one of the uh, sort of striking effects about the survival of the Taliban is the extent to which it was able to withstand 20 years of systematic US effort to decapitate its leadership. Um, you know, incidentally, as a side note, just to follow up my conversation with, the people, with Peter, uh, I have long argued that decapitation shouldn't be solely or even principally based about uh, weakening the group and often the illusion of weakening the group, but about shaping what kind of leadership will be in place. And so, you know, one of the mistakes in Afghanistan, in my view, was killing Mullah Mansour, the previous leader of the Taliban. If we had killed Siraj Chakani, we would have been in a much better shape keeping, uh, keeping um, Mansour alive and having him be at the top of the leadership in the Taliban regime today and having to deal with him as opposed to uh, the current lineup of the Taliban leadership. Uh, but this, that's sort of just a small side note to the issue that um, if we leave behind states that are problematic and that generate enough of the sustainment of the terrorist group, then uh, we will still be seeing incarnation of, the, incarnation of the terrorist group. So a great example is Northern Nigeria, where uh, the Nigerian government uh, between 2015 and 2017 significantly weakened Boko Haram, but didn't do anything on state building. And today, Boko Haram and its mutation, the Islamic State in West Africa is more powerful than ever and challenging far greater space in Nigeria than it did before. So just leaving the state deficiency hanging, it's uh, not addressing the root causes to use the common parlance, is a prescription for seeing the mutation and repeat of uh, the phenomenon all the time. But the flip side of doing this very extensive, very, um, uh, very demanding state building efforts, particularly if they involve large US troop deployments, is all the problems that we talked about that we really don't know how to do it. Um, we don't know how to change the uh, politics of the countries. It's creating blowbacks like the rise of domestic extremism. So unfortunately, that is not silver bullet. And, and this, this tension of how much we pull back and how it festers abroad and how much we will lean forward to try to addressing the festering and pull back will stay with us even as um, we are in this very new, very different geostrategic environment. And I expect that the, the way we'll try to be squaring the dilemma is by relying on militia and other actors, but we'll again find that two is not the magic wand. Thanks very much, Mohammed. Let me turn to you and let, let me also add a question to it. Uh, the jihadist movement obviously is very focused on the West and on the United States in particular. And yet, if you look at what the Russian regimes under Yeltsin and Putin have done to the Muslim population in Chechnya, for example. Tens of thousands of people uh, have been casualties in the two wars there. If you look at what the Chinese Communist Party has done with the Uyghurs, why is it so focused on, on the United States in particular and not, I'm not arguing obviously for terrorist attacks against either Russia or China, but not on those two, two governments? Thank you. I mean, I think uh, the Russians have had their fair share of dealing with, you know, with Chechnya, uh, at least in the late 1990s and, uh, and early 2000s. Uh, but, you know, it might also have to do uh, with the way that they have uh, adopted a more law enforcement, more, uh, you know, surgical maybe approach, at least uh, in the case of Russia, instead of just mobilizing their entire military and not using the language of existential threat which I think was a major uh, you know, pitfall with our uh, counter-terrorist strategy after 9-11. Uh, uh, but I also wanted to make a quick comment about uh, nation building and uh, how that project uh, did not unfold well. Um, I think what the Middle East needs even today more than nation building is region building. Uh, I think the Middle East more urgent problem is that as a region, it's very weak. So, uh, so smaller conflicts, you know, get regionalized, metastasized to other countries and escalate because there is really no, like I said, a regional uh, security architecture or framework for any type of cooperation, conflict mitigation, conflict, uh, you know, prevention, preventive diplomacy or anything like that. And that, I think that's where the United States could 
contribute the most in terms of building that, uh, you know, an, a, a relatively institutionalized strong uh, region. Uh, also, you know, I think what could also help is having a more streamlined uh, Middle East policy. I don't think right now we have a Middle East policy. I think we have issue specific policies. We have an oil policy, we have an Israel policy, we have a counter proliferation policy. Uh, maybe we have a human rights promotion policy, but does that come together as a package in terms of it being coherent and internally consistent? I would argue that package is just not there. And I think as uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned, as the Chinese and the Russians become more, uh, you know, assertive and as they adopt a more, you know, forward posture, the need for the United States as we retrench from the region to adopt a more coherent and uh, internally consistent foreign policy towards the Middle East is going to become uh, more imperative. And, uh, and also, I will just uh, add on, uh, uh, you know, conclude on this, that uh, I do believe that there is also this perception, uh, perhaps among some, you know, some Russians, perhaps among some Chinese as well, that there is a level of playing politics with violent non-state actors and uh, Wahhabi inspired terrorism on the part of the United States that on occasion, maybe we have tried to leverage uh, components of that uh, challenge in order to uh, pursue certain foreign policy tracks, for example, you know, with uh, with Xinjiang, with Uyghurs in uh, in China, even uh, maybe in Syria uh, with, with the Russians. So I think that politicization of, uh, of you know, a Wahhabi inspired terrorism is something that, you, that we need to maybe uh, think about a little bit more deeply and see uh, you know, the cost versus benefit of, uh, of playing politics uh, with, uh, with violent non-state actors. Ahmed, thank you. Um, uh, Alex, last question to you and then I'll turn to the uh, audience questions. Can you envision a scenario where we wind up going back into Afghanistan? Uh, so I can Senator see Graham, uh, not that he's in charge uh, of the military or the government, but he said we will be back there. Uh, I don't see us doing regime change and occupation in Afghanistan again, but I could see us doing targeted operations, much like going to get Osama bin Laden. You know, if there's a high value target, uh, using a platform nearby and then projecting power in for a discrete effect. Uh, but I don't see it. Uh, I don't see large scale operations in Afghanistan. No. Okay. Uh, let me uh, try to take. We got a, quite a few questions and comments that have come in. Um, Eric, let me start with you. Um, and this is from James Brand, who um, questions NATO uh, as a, an alliance and its role and activities in Afghanistan, and said he only thinks really three nations were willing to fight. Um, how, how do you see the, the role of NATO in, in its involvement in Afghanistan? And also with the withdrawal decision, what impact has that, that had on NATO as well? Yeah, um, well, there are a couple of different elements, I think, to unpack there, David. One is that uh, I do think we uh, you know, have to um, be grateful to our allies for having, for the first time in NATO's history, invoked Article 5 after we were attacked on 9-11. Um, and at least as the questioner points out, some of them being willing to, uh, to actually uh, fight. I mean, I think if you look, for instance, at our Canadian colleagues, uh, they took disproportionate uh, casualties. They ended up in some very rough uh, places. They were uh, basically had Kandahar and uh, it was very, very tough for them. Um, Dutch were in Oregon and uh, took again, dis disproportionate uh, casualties. Uh, but I'm also aware of the phenomenon that the questioner uh, highlights, which is uh, I went on you know, many visits when I was undersecretary to Afghanistan and heard some of our own troops you know, characterize ISAF as I saw Americans fighting. Um, and uh, there certainly were a lot of national caveats 
that were put into place, um, you know, which, uh, you know, kind of were characterized in some cases as like, we'll only fight, you know, on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the morning, but we won't go outside the wire any other time. Um, and Secretary Gates, you know, uh, talked about this that uh, several NATO ministerials, um, and he raised the question of whether we were developing a uh, a kind of multi-level NATO with some allies who were willing to fight and who and some who weren't. And um, I think that that is going to be an ongoing problem in NATO, as is, for instance the differential um, assessment of the threat that Russia presents inside the alliance. Um, moreover, we have an even bigger challenge in the alliance now, which is the presence of a number of authoritarian leaning governments uh, who are actually drawing sustenance from the Putin regime, the sort of mini Putins uh, in, inside our own house. And so I think the alliance um, uh, which was already facing a lot of challenges is going to go through a very rough period, not least because of the bad blood that's been uh, generated by the failure to consult adequately on the withdrawal. Fonda, let me ask you a, a question from Keith Long, or maybe it's, yeah, it's a question. Um, he, he worries, are we about to blunder again with the Taliban by cozying up to them and possibly funding a Taliban government in Afghanistan. What, what should we do? How should we uh, deal with the, the Taliban now? Well, the United States is certainly, as of now, not cozying to the Taliban. In fact, we have seized the uh, accounts of the Afghan Federal Reserve Bank uh, that were held in the United States, $9.6 billion. And we have suspended any kind of distribution of aid to Afghanistan and forced the IMF and the World Bank to do the same. Europeans uh, as well. This is in striking contrast to uh, behavior of Russia, China, and Iran, all of which were sworn enemies of the Taliban in the 1990s, uh, uh, supported the Northern Alliance in multiple ways, and all three of which had several years ago made their, made their peace with the Taliban, assessing that the Taliban was coming to power. So the US distance from the Taliban regime is far greater than the distance of other countries. But a question that really is being posed is about what kind of tools do we have to shape uh, the Taliban regime? And I specifically use the term shape. I don't think that we have the capacity to bring the Taliban regime down. The Taliban regime has the capacity to bring itself down. It might make a whole set of mistakes, some of which are becoming um, visible already, that might generate enough internal fragmentation and enable opposition that largely folded to start facing uh, significant challenges but, uh, and, and be challenged in the firmness of its rule. But this kind of destabilization will only come out from, will only come in from within. Um, the outsiders, whether it's the Chinese or the Russians or the United States and, and Western European allies do not have the capacity to do that. So we can slap uh, all kinds of um, very blanket sanctions. The Taliban already is under those sanctions. They, they have not been lifted and try to treat Afghanistan in the same kind of isolation that we treated the regime in the 1990s. That in my view will um, significantly worsen uh, the already very difficult uh, conditions for the Afghan people, a country where 90% of the population still lives in poverty where even prior to the Taliban victory in July and August, uh, one third of the population was in the state of acute food insecurity. Many people are falling into that. So we can treat Afghanistan in the same way that we treat North Korea, Venezuela, Iran, apply a whole set of economic sanctions that will tank uh, the economy and create very difficult, sometimes horrific, humanitarian circumstances, but will not bring the regime down. Why? Because the regime has access to enough income from both illicit economies and local regional trade, and potentially will have access to income from its dealing with Russia and Iran, in addition to the Gulf states like Saudi Arabia uh, and UAE to continue plodding on. So in my view, um, just kind of having the same blanket starvation, isolation, rejection, motivated perhaps by human rights considerations or 
uh, by um, uh, other considerations is neither going to bring the regime down nor going to be an effective policy. What I would much rather like us to see is much more discrete bargaining over specific line accounts, over specific behaviors, whether this is linked to uh, what we will be asking the Taliban to do in the counterterrorism space and, and not do, not allow to happen, and what we will be asking in terms of human rights, women's rights, political pluralism. And the best outcome, in my view, we are looking at an Iran-like regime. Um, the worst outcome would be a regime that's very much like the 1990s and most likely mm -hmm. we'll end up with something like Saudi Arabia with more unpleasant twists to it. Anda, thank you. Um, uh, Mohammed, let me come to you with a question um, from FIU's Lana Shaheda. Um, and, and she's picking up on the discussion we had about nation versus building versus state building versus your, your phrase of region building. And she's wondering, um, are, are you suggesting that the weak region um, it, the, the, about building a, a region uh, because it's weak as opposed to weak states, do you suggest intervention into the region as a whole? Are we allowing history to repeat itself if we were to try something like that? Thank you, David and Lana. No, what I was uh, suggesting and implying was, uh, was starting maybe with the Persian Gulf subregion uh, of the Middle East, and maybe then we can uh, expand it further into the Levant and, uh, and South Asia, and even including Afghanistan and Pakistan, is to have some kind of a rudimentary initially uh, conflict mitigation and management, uh, you know, infrastructure in the region. And having that uh, infrastructure and architecture being inclusive, because whatever efforts uh, we have taken so far uh, as the United States in improving regional security has not been inclusive. Normally, we leave out Iran, we kind of try to build an alliance against Iran, as opposed to including, for example, the Iranians in that conversation. And those efforts, you know, for obvious regions uh, have failed. And I think they're bound to fail moving forward as well. So I think creating or facilitating the creation of, uh, of that regional security infrastructure, maybe it could be the United States lost uh, longest lasting legacy that we leave in the Middle East. As we, I think, uh, accelerate our retrenchment uh, from the region, and as the Chinese and as the Russians uh, make, you know, their presence more, you know, felt and they, you know, even throw their, uh, their weight around. But uh, to kind of touch, uh, if you give me a second on what uh, uh, Wanda said, I think that was a good point about why Iranians are, uh, seem to be getting closer to, uh, to the Taliban as opposed to the 1990s. I think one reason for that might be that they're trying to uh, keep that firewall or you know, uh, supposed firewall between the Taliban and ISIS. And uh, to kind of use the, uh, the keep you know, Taliban close by so they don't gravitate uh, towards ISIS and, and Al Qaeda, which uh, has been Iran's you know, worst fears in, you know, in the region, especially in Iraq and, uh, and in Syria. But, uh, but you know, the, after the cabinet was announced yesterday and the Haqqani is having, I think, four uh, cabinet positions and then the being closer to Al-Qaeda, I think the Iranians might need to also fine tune and, uh, and change that uh, policy a little bit moving forward. Thank you, Alex. Last question to you can, uh, comes from uh, Hernan Lopez um, asking about should we be coordinating counterterrorism strategies with China and Russia? Um, and then someone else asked, is that in fact a good idea? Wondering, in fact, is that a bad idea to coordinate with them? Well, you know, uh, it's like people who say we should coordinate cyber defense with them. Uh, how much when you do open kimono uh, cooperation with your partners and you share information, how much of that can they use against you? We should certainly continue to coordinate our counterterrorism uh, capabilities with our allies and partners, right? Our NATO allies, our major non-NATO allies, and other partners like, uh, say, India or uh, Chile, right? Uh, or South Africa. And so uh, we should continue to do this. We should continue to coordinate. 
where our interests overlap with the Russians and the Chinese, we should cooperate if it doesn't delegitimize our efforts to uh, bring attention to things like their human rights abuses, uh, their cyber criminal operations and things like that. Wonderful. Um, Eric Edelman, Banda, Philip Brown, Mohammed Haman Yunvash, Alex Crowther, um, terrific panel. Really, thank you very much, all four of you, for a fascinating discussion. We could have gone on a lot longer, but we can't. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back over to Hector to wrap us up. Thank you, David. Appreciate your time as well. <clears throat> as our panelists accurately pointed out, for coming generations of students, September 11th is history rather than memory. In a recent Atlantic article, Stanford's Amy Seagart made a similar point and advocated to put emotion back into the teaching of 9-11. This event, among, among many others occurring throughout the nation this week, look exactly to do just that. So on behalf of the Green School and the Gordon Institute, I would like to extend our genuine gratitude to our featured speakers for a riveting discussion. Special thanks to Peter Bergen for joining us to discuss his recent book, The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden, and likewise, a special thanks to our outstanding panelists and moderators, Dr. Edelman, Dr. Philip Brown, Dr. Homoyanovich, Dr. Crowther, and of course, David, we are in your debt. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, encourage those who are still with us to join us tomorrow for a special panel on the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake, where a panel of distinguished speakers, including Ambassador Daniel Foote, U.S. Special Envoy to Haiti, <clears throat> and Lieutenant General retired Ken Keene, Associate Dean for the Leadership Development at Emory University, as well as Ms. Ann Lee, CEO of Community Organization Relief Effort, and Jean-Marc de Maté, CEO of Hôpital Albert Schweitzer, Haiti, will, have, will discuss the Haiti earthquake response and relief efforts and how to support Haitian-led solutions to the security and political crisis engulfing the nation. Additionally, I'd like to invite all students to join us for our fall 2021 National Security Workshop Series featuring intelligence practitioners from FBI, DHS, National Counterterrorism Center, and NGA. More information on this program will, is available on our website at the Jack D. at coordinateinstitute.fiu.edu. And finally, on October 1st, join us for JGI's Insider's Guide for Careers in National Security and Intelligence. To learn more about the amazing careers awaiting in the National Security and Intelligence workforce, and to learn a little bit more about FIU's nationally recognized ICCA intelligence workforce development program. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you in upcoming programming. Have a great day.